<laughs> High yield. It never rains, does it, and sells away. You've got one problem with the carbon monoxide. Along comes a bacteria. Hello and welcome back to the channel. My name is Ed Hope, a junior doctor in the UK. And today we're gonna to be breaking down the Animate Cells at Work code black. Now we're big fans of Cells at Work on the channel. Why is it called code black? Well, this one takes place in an unhealthy body. And not only that, a lot of the themes are, let's say a little bit more adult. So they deal with smoking, alcoholism, and sexually transmitted diseases. So this isn't for everyone. I've actually already reviewed this episode when it was a manga. So I'll leave a link up there if you want to check it out. And so spoilers, I kind of know what's going to happen. So let's jump into it. <laughs> That intro is really blooming cool. I had the kind of hairs on the back of my neck tingling. I love the slightly different animation style and the sound. I remember saying that on the first episode of Cells at Work. The sound there, it's so good, so ominous. And this opening sequence of the red blood cells being killed here is a homage to the first ever episode of Cells at Work because this streptococcus pneumonia was the bacteria we saw there. And just to remind you, it's a hemolytic bacteria, meaning it can break down red blood cells, you know, as perfectly demonstrated here. And this is a great little intro to cells at work black you notice things aren't quite as healthy as usual so the cells are working harder here and they look a little bit more unkempt and that's saying something because the body in the first cells at work had a hell of a lot of problems too and spot these greasy little grubbiness here in the blood vessels we'll come on to them later <laughs> and we meet the red blood cell. So again, that's the protagonist in this series. And this time he's a guy and he's also got that little quiff that we saw the red blood cell have in usual cells at work, which I know many people thought was a sign that she was a sickle cell, which, you know, I was never convinced of. <laughs> They've got this great old school film, like harking back to the good old days. And the background music played on a recorder conjures up this more innocent childhood like time when no doubt things were healthier before the vices of, you know, cigarette and drinking and the other stresses of adulthood. And look at how innocent the white blood cell here is. And we've already seen a sneak peek of how badass she is at the beginning. <laughs> what the hell? All the cells are a bit more innocent. Apart from the cytotoxic T cells, which suddenly Got these proper, like, low cut man pecs showing. Konnichiwa! Everyone's favourite. At least the platelets are still cute. I'm being a connoisseur of the manga, I can tell you here that this is a character we're going to meet in episode 2. This is a hepatocyte, because episode two is all about alcoholism, and obviously hepatocyte is one of the cells in the liver, and they aren't that kinky in real life. We meet the chief cell in the stomach. Now, it's that's its actual name. It's called a chief cell. They've not just put chief on there because he's the boss. The chief cell's job here is to secrete pepsinogen into the stomach. There are also cells called parietal cells that secrete the hydrochloric acid, which is represented here as lava. The lava or the acid helps to kill any bugs that may have been in food that we've ingested, but also the acid helps to activate this pepsinogen that's produced by the chief cells. It turns pepsinogen into pepsin, and that's the active enzyme that breaks down proteins. <laughs> I've said this throughout my first look at the first series. Not only are the stories about cellular physiology and anatomy, they also deal with many of the themes that we see in healthcare. One of the big criticisms we often get in healthcare is that we don't introduce ourselves. Often if we're busy or have a very brief encounter to help another colleague out with a patient, we may not introduce ourselves. Totally unprofessional, totally unacceptable understand why it's often a criticism and no doubt why they've put it in here. Good bit of feedback from the chief cell. Our new red blood cell then has to orientate himself around the circulatory system and he uses this 
funny old diagram of it actually. They seem to have put all the veins on the right hand side of the body and all the arteries on the left hand side of the body. And I understand it's supposed to be conceptual, which is a good way of learning, but for clarity, it's only the major blood vessels that have this kind of asymmetry. So the superior and inferior vena cava going into the heart, they're on the right side and the aorta coming off the heart is on the left side. All these other blood vessels, so the pulmonary vasculature here, the brachial blood vessels and the carotid and jugular, the blood supply to the brain, head and neck should all have both arteries and veins. So both red and blue blood vessels in the diagram. This is definitely me being nitpicky though, because this is, uh, as I say, a nice little conceptual way uh, for him to understand things. <laughs> In the original cells at work, we only ever saw the red blood cell carrying one container of oxygen. And here, obviously to show the red blood cells are working harder, they have to carry two containers, hinting at the strain they're under in this less healthy body. But in reality, an individual red blood cell can only carry slightly more oxygen if there's some available around it or if the pH is higher or the temperature is lower as demonstrated by the oxygen dissociation curve but nowhere near twice as much oxygen. But what could happen is that someone could be unhealthy that it raises their heart rate so each individual red blood cell would be working harder because it'll be traveling around the body more often although it's worth noting what I just said means the work is really being done by the heart. <laughs> exactly demonstrating what we just talked about. So the red blood cells here are traveling a lot quicker than in our healthy body from the original cells at work. <laughs> Not so cute now. Are they? It's very realistic because this is <laughs> what kids are like nowadays. AA2153. No idea why they've picked that. Numbers and letters. If anyone knows, let me know. I can't think of any cellular physiology reason why that is the case. <laughs> And we end this scene with a lovely food bolus dropping from the lower esophageal sphincter into the stomach there. I don't know. I'm going to get the same way to get the same way. I'm going to get the same way. I'm going to get the same way. Okay, so we meet a mentor to our red blood cell and he's saying that things didn't always used to be like this. Under stress, they've had to prioritize oxygen to just the vital organs. In the last episode of the original Cells at Work, we learned about the concept of shock. So a life-threatening emergency where you have a circulatory collapse leading to lack of oxygen to the tissues. This is what happens when the blood supply is reduced very abruptly, what we call acutely. But what we're really talking about here is chronic hypoperfusion. So a slow reduction in tissue perfusion over many months and years, meaning the body has time to adapt. It's not clear here when they talk about stress, whether they mean psychological stress, so anxiety related or more of a physical stress, so impacts of unhealthy lifestyle changes, but I'm guessing it's a bit of both. Jesus Christ, that's pretty ominous. I don't remember the manga being that sinister. <laughs> the LDL guy's dumping cholesterol here. I certainly remember that from the manga. All these greasy and grubby deposits we've been seeing in the background of the blood vessels, they are plaques of lipids that over time collect in the blood vessels and narrow them in a process called atherosclerosis, a type of vascular disease. The LDL, the illegal dumpers we see here, are molecules created by the liver to store high levels of cholesterol in the blood vessels. So they circulate around the blood and end up being deposited in the intimate layer of the blood vessel wall. This causes narrowing itself, but it's actually the inflammatory response to this, mediated by our good old friends, the macrophages, 
that really takes this to the next level. The macrophage eat these oxidized LDL and turn into foam cells, which increases the inflammatory process. We then get calcium deposited into that and that hardens the arteries. This narrowing and hardening of the artery restricts blood flow as demonstrated here as a red blood cell has more difficulty getting down the blood vessel. There's plenty of reserve in the system though. All of us will have these atherosclerotic changes going on already in our body, but the blood vessels are significantly wide enough for that not to be a problem. But clearly it can get so narrow that it starts depriving oxygen of the tissues that blood vessel supplies. And this leads to what we call ischemia. For example, in the heart, this can lead to something called ischemic heart disease. One of its manifestations is angina, which is a reproducible chest pain on exertion as the heart works hard, it temporarily outstrips its blood supply. Even worse than this, the atheroma in the blood vessel may rupture meaning a clot will form there and completely occlude the blood vessel. Using our example again, if that happens in the coronary arteries in the heart, this would lead to a myocardial infarction, commonly called a heart attack. Is the body going to be all right? Well, no, not, not if it carries on like this. They'll end up coming into the emergency department with a myocardial infarction to see Someone like me. So the red blood cells done his homework because that's an absolutely appropriate route. So the split he's talking about, let's go back to our diagram, is here. So on the arch of the aorta. So turning upwards would take him up the left common carotid artery. But they're going to continue down the descending aorta to the gut. So they'll either be taking the celiac trunk if they're going to the foregut, so that's the blood supply that supplies the stomach and the liver, or they'll be taking the superior mesenteric artery, so that supplies the midgut, so the pancreas, the small bowel, and some of the large bowel, or they'll be taking the inferior mesenteric artery, so that's the main blood supply to the large bowel. Quick little interruption for this video, just to let you know that I have some face masks available if you guys need them. They're mandatory in a lot of places at the moment. And yeah, I've, I've designed some exclusively for the channel. So they have all the cells of the immune system. So loads of the cells we're seeing in these series. For example, we have our cinephil here, a neutrophil, a red blood cell, a basophil, all the cells you read system, all the cells that are keeping us safe at the moment in this pandemic. And also when you open up the mask, a little coronavirus sneaking in the top. And for really nerdy people like me, some of the cells, if you uncover them, are actually reacting, doing part of the adaptive immune response against the viral infection. I know you can get face masks in a lot of places, but instead of getting them from some big multi-conglomerate, I thought you might want to support an independent creator. That would be awesome. And it's Back to your scheduled broadcast. <laughs> and the carbon monoxide is here. I remember this from the manga. Really nasty chemical, this one. As the mentor says, hemoglobin has a much higher affinity for carbon monoxide than oxygen. It sounds like a bit of a design flaw in our build, but I'm guessing we just wouldn't have encountered carbon monoxide much when we were evolving. So hemoglobin actually has a 240 times greater affinity for carbon monoxide than it does for oxygen. In reality, what that means is if carbon monoxide is in the atmosphere and you breathe it in, your red blood cells are gonna take the carbon monoxide and not the oxygen. Therefore, you know, there's a lot in the environment. It, it can be fatal. I can't kill anybody. <laughs> it never rains, does it, in cells away. You've got one problem with the carbon monoxide. Along comes a bacteria. This is sort of a coincidence, because if you were to inhale loads of carbon monoxide, it wouldn't leave you more susceptible to infection. But I know where this is heading. I know what's causing the carbon monoxide. I won't ruin it for you now. Um, but the reason why there's carbon monoxide there could lead to an increase why there's more likely to be bacteria there too, which... I'll come on to. Well, Jesus Christ. The pneumococcus made short work of those red blood cells, <laughs> which is what we said earlier, it's hemolytic, so it can break down red blood cells very easily. Oh, it's 
Yes, mate. The new neutrophil. Just as badass from the first one. Maybe even a little bit more. His mentor is absolutely right. Once a cell has fully matured, it has limited options on what type of cells it can turn into, hence why stem cells are so important in research because they can change into any other cells. Although some cells do have the ability to change into other cells, we call that metaplasia, but it's often not that useful. Having said that though, this 100% cannot happen in a red blood cell because it's lost all its organelles and its nucleus, so there's no way it can produce any kind of proteins to be anything other than a red blood cell. And that's also why its life is limited to just 120 days. So this chat will always be a red blood cell. And we have the big reveal with that kind of mystery music that the carbon monoxide increase is from smoking. It's probably in the title for this video. I, I don't know why I tried to keep it a secret. And this is totally accurate. Often when I do a blood test on people that are smokers, I will find incidentally that their carbon monoxide is raised in the blood. Having said that, carbon monoxide, although it is a toxin, is probably one of the least toxic things in cigarettes. That's really saying something. And what I was saying earlier, it may not be a coincidence that we had carbon monoxide in the blood as well as a pneumococcal infection, although the two aren't directly related. Smokers are more likely to get respiratory tract infections for multiple reasons. So it damages the structure of the lungs and the airways. It also paralyzes the mucociliary escalator. So the little hairs that help you clear out the mucus that all the bacteria stick to. So if they aren't getting cleared out, the, the bacteria colonize the area. The pneumocyte said they hadn't seen cigarette smoke for 10 years and a lot of smoking damage is permanent, but some of it is reversible, particularly after a very long amount of time, like 10 years. So from the World Health Organization's website, so after 10 years, your risk of lung cancer falls to about half of that of a smoker and your risk of cancer of the mouth, throat and esophagus, bladder, cervix and pancreas decreases. And after 15 years, the risk of coronary heart disease is that of a non-smokers. Also, you wouldn't want this neutrophil in your lung at the moment. Neutrophils and macrophages are actually the cause of a lot of damage from smoking. <laughs> That's why it's not a good idea for her to stick around because as the noxious particles and toxins go into the lungs, it activates the neutrophils and they begin releasing their digestive enzyme stuff like elastase and elastase breaks down the, your lovely, beautiful, elastic connective tissue in the lung. This is a much more irreversible type of lung damage. And after sort of 10, 20 years, this can lead to something called emphysema, part of the picture of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. So there you go. That's my look at the first episode of Cells at Work Black. I know season two of Cells at Work has just aired as well. I'm going to try and get that video out for you as quick as possible. If you like this, please share it around, give it a like, give it a comment. What did I miss? What would you like to hear me talk about more of? And if you want to support the channel as well, you can get some of the face coverings that I mentioned earlier. And it just leaves me to say thank you so, so much for all the continued support on the channel. I hope you're all well given this difficult time. Doing these things, connecting with you guys in this community has been a huge positive that's helped get me through all this. So on that note, thanks again and I'll see you soon.